What's up, deal makers? This was Ask Alex number 71. We did a deal review today, and this was awesome because we actually just broke down and dove into one of our recent flip deals. Alex, what were your biggest takeaways today, man? Oh, man, I love these deal reviews because we go into detail on certain deals that we've already completed, like this one. It was a six-figure flip. A lot of learning we shared on here. Also, we shared all the people that contributed to this win. And if you want all the other details, you got to check out the webinar. Let's go. All right. What's up, my deal makers? We are talking about deals today. We're going to be reviewing a couple of deals today. We're going to be reviewing uh, one of our flips that we just finished. And then we also are reviewing one of the deals that we're going to be keeping as a rental. So I'm super excited about that to show you guys some of the inventory, right? Some of the stuff that we're going to be keeping, some of the things that we just finished. Uh, there's my man, Will. Let me promote him here. Let me get my co-host in there. What's up, my man, Will? Hello. How are you, brother? I'm amazing. How are you, brother? Ready for a fun day of deal review. These are uh, these are fun because we're actually going to get into the weeds and uh, look at some deals here today. And uh, I think we have some good ones on the list, right? Oh, yeah. So we're doing, uh, I think, Rincon, uh, which is that one that we just finished the flip on. I posted about that today on some nice before and after pictures. Uh, complete Dude, transformation. Before and after on that was like... Wow, like transformation. Talk about, you know, setting the comp for the neighborhood, setting the, the kind of the value in the area. Like, dude, that was a, a killer, killer project, killer team job on that one, right? Yeah, man, that one's awesome. So I think and the whole team contributed that one as uh, most of our deals, right? Uh, it's teamwork. It makes a dream work. And then we're going to be reviewing that this new Lancaster property that uh, very likely is going to become a burr. I mean, we're going to keep that property long term. Uh, it looks like a great long term hold. Cool, man. I know th those will be fun to uh, to get into, so we'll dive into those uh, here a little bit uh, later on in the webinar. In the meantime, um, like, give us a quick update, Alex. I know a lot uh, lots been going on this week. We've been busy um, as can be here, uh, working on some projects, working on some deals, working on some escrows in and out. So, like, kind of give us an update. What's been going on, man? Oh man, lots and lots of stuff going on from uh, multiple states, multiple types of deals. So where do we start? Okay, so first things uh, is this, this bird deal we're gonna review today. We made, uh, we just finished our other first bird in the Antelope Valley. Uh, it took a little bit longer than we expected to get it rented and do all that, but we uh, got the right tenant in there based on what we, uh, you know, getting out there, finding uh, different prospects for the tenant um, pool that we looked at. And so uh, that one's finished. I'm excited about that project now being finished and us continuing to hold properties. Um, I've been making a lot of progress on that one too, Alex, like, you know, just to jump in there real quick is like, you know, like you said, we learned a lot on that project, right? Like on the rental side, um, we've, you know, we actually explored section eight, you know, which is something that we've talked about on, on one of our past webinars. Um, you know, we've had a couple of, of people on the webinar in the past that have seen some success, um, including one of our partners on, on some of our deals out there in the section eight market. So, you know, I, I think there was a lot to learn about renting in the Section 8 market, and it's something that I think we'll probably end up renting to future Section 8 tenants uh, because of our experience with this one, right? It was it was positive, although we didn't end up selecting one. Correct, correct. Uh, and because now we have the knowledge, we've uh, asked some more questions to our network people that have rentals out there on Section 8. It's a different type of tenant pool. So we learned a lot. We decided to go with another ten a tenant because they had a superior overall, you know, just application and everything that we saw just seemed to be a better fit but i think on, on future projects out there in antelope valley um we'll be more we'll be more prepared and um ready to potentially rent out to somebody on section eight um also i think the bedroom bathroom count is very important i think we could get more on uh something and this property only ended up being two bedrooms so i think that was a, a reason as well that we just didn't see a big difference from what we can get on a regular tenant and section eight um, and with uh properties with bigger uh pet bedroom bathroom count you can get more for that property. So we learned a lot. It's great. I'm excited. Um, as far as uh, the other updates, we've been working, I've been working on a lot of, on this 18 unit. Uh, it's been just taking up a lot of my bandwidth. It's been, you know, just conversation after conversation, different type of emails, um, looking at the loan product that we're going to be selecting, um, changing the structure of the deal with who I'm going to be partnering on the deal. You're on the deal. Plus, uh, we, we brought in another partner. And so 
just a lot of moving parts with that property. And I think I've said it before that if you're doing a multifamily deal, typically like if it's like your only deal that you're working on, you know, it's going to take a lot of your bandwidth, but we still have, you know, another 20 something projects plus this multifamily deal. So I think that has been something that I kind of overlooked, but um, you know, it, it is what it is. We're figuring it out and, you know, a lot of learning on that as well. I think the next multifamily deal that we do will also be more prepared and uh, understand what we're going to need to, what we're up against. And going those, are, those are for learning though, right? Not, not, uh, you know, not losses, right? They're learning yeah. their, their, you know, abilities that, that now we know. And like you said, now we can pivot and make those adjustments um, on future buildings, right? On future lending opportunities, on future, um, you know, situations like that. So that's good stuff, man. Um, and yeah. I know it's, it's been, it's been a lot of work, right? So it can't be understated. Like you said, man, like purchasing one of these apartments is something that some investors do and that can consume their whole time. And like you said, concurrently doing as many deals as we're doing, it is a, a lot of work. So um, we're excited to get all those to the finish line, right? Exactly. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, my deal makers. There you so, go. Um, I'm not dead. Uh, also, we finished a Rincon property. Uh, this was a flip that we did in Sun Valley. Uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with the property because we did a great meetup there. Uh, it was one of our project managers. Uh, first projects our new project manager Almari so shout out to him he did a fantastic job on it um also we had uh, issues with the listing agent on that property because we promised to list back with the person that gave us the deal but they ended up going on vacation having family issues all everything that could go wrong on the listing side went wrong on that we thought the property was going to end up making like kind of breaking even maybe just making five to ten thousand dollars after a significant rehab i think we spent over ninety thousand dollars on this rehab and then we we actually closed on it and flipped it and it was a six figure deal. We sold it for, uh, you know, 840, which was almost a hundred thousand more than we originally uh, projected. And it therefore not only, it did not become like a break even kind of make a little bit of money deal. It turned into a six figure flip. So um, and like a, a record sitting <laughs> yeah. house in that, in that market. Right. So it was actually pretty big time uh, yeah. set the new, you know, new standard for comps in that neighborhood. So that was nice. So that's that, happy for that. Um, and then uh, the, uh, we funded this new Lancaster deal that we're closing on. This was Sergio's first deal, one of our new acquisitions managers. And you know, we were both very happy for him to get his first deal. And then we also got it funded by a private money lender. Uh, somebody in our tribe stepped up, somebody that's been following us for some time, somebody that we've been uh, networking with and connecting with for a long time, adding value. Well, he decided to park uh, some, you know, over $100,000 into this deal to help us fund the deal. And it's already done. We're going to close on that later this week or early, early next week. And it's less stressful for you and I, because also we've been doing you know, a lot of deals. And so sometimes it comes to the last minute and then we're funding these deals at the last minute to have this already deal done and kind of funded a week, 10 days in advance. It's a lot less pressure and just it feels like a big weight off my shoulders. And I'm sure you feel the same, right? I agree, Alex. I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the cool thing about this deal more than anything, right, is that it, we're getting it funded by somebody from the tribe, somebody that's been coming out to the webinars, um, you know, been paying attention, been taking action and just happened to have, um, you know, some liquid cash becoming available and said, hey, you know what, I, I think I can move that around. And then instead of putting it back into this account, why not, um, you know, put it in with you guys and, and make a little bit of interest and, you know, take a little bit uh, more active step in learning about this specific property. So, um, I think that's a cool win all around, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and um, guys, I don't know if, if you guys are using the chat feature over there, but if you want to use the chat feature, you go ahead and let us know. Um, in the meantime, as we get things going here, we're going to start looking at some deals in a second with Alex um, and do a deal review. Um, but let us know real quick, guys, where it is that you guys are from, where you guys are looking at deals, where you guys are making your investments. We want to know where you guys are at and where we can connect on Instagram uh, as well. And then in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and just drop a a Google link in there. And if you guys um, in the call have any interest ever in looking at some of our opportunities uh, to lend, I think this lender is, is lending us about hundred K and going to make about 10 grand. Um, you know, those aren't always the same rates. Um, it, it, it varies deal by deal and opportunity by opportunity. But um, you know, this particular case, this guy's going to make a, a good quick little return on uh, on a basic deal, right, Alex? Uh, maybe a four-month timeline is, is what our usual timeline is on these out in that area. Um, so it should be a win-win for, for everybody involved. And if you guys ever have any interest, um, go ahead and fill out that form over there and, and we'll get in touch and um, you know see if there's a project that makes sense for you. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that's one of the ways to be, become VIP with us and learn alongside us, get access to team meetings, get access to the team, get access to the training. 
uh, the individual training that we do. We spend an hour with you guys on, on you know, for free weekly um, in different subjects and different things that we do. But uh, when you become a private money lender with us, there's other uh, additional, much bigger benefits uh, that you can learn from us uh, much more detailed. So check that out if you guys are interested. Um, also, we uh, are now going to be going into escrow, I think, this next coming week on our big island Hawaii flip. We got this deal uh, some time ago. Um, we rehabbed it. It's back on the market. We have five offers on the property right now. Um, it looks like it might actually be a six-figure deal because we bought it at 180 and we put in about $35,000 into it. So we're into it in the low twos and we have offers at 330, 335. Um, 325, kind of in that range. So i um, excited about that one. Wasn't a property we wanted to hold on to because it was uh, just kind of in a, not an ideal area for a long-term rental, just didn't hit the numbers. And, and so we're flipping that one, but that's exciting to get that one going because I think we had now have three projects in Hawaii or three properties in Hawaii, You know, one that we're keeping, two that we're keeping, one that we're flipping and another one coming up that we're gonna flip. So with four projects total in Hawaii right now of the 23, 22 deals that we're working on. Um, also, yeah, guys, a lot, lot of lot of deals out in in uh, in four states now, like you mentioned earlier, right? So there, there's a couple projects here, a couple projects there, a couple projects everywhere. It seems like now. Yeah, yeah. I, when I looked at the 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 house list that we have, I was like, wow. I mean, we actually have uh, properties going on in four different states. The majority of our business is in Southern California, but you know, since we I live in Hawaii, and we're doing some deals out there, and then we're investing into the 18 unit in Arizona, and then we have a deal that will likely flip or possibly wholesale in, in um, Las Vegas. And so, you know, just kind of West Coast uh, dominant, but um, yeah, and it's exciting to be able to, you know, be in different states and you know, do business in different states. Uh, also guys, big, big uh, meetup we're gonna do in downtown LA. I'm coming back, I'm in Guadalajara right now, but I'm headed back to downtown LA on Tuesday and we'll be doing a big, big a free meetup uh, in that same location that we do it uh, in the big event center that uh, kind of creative warehouse that, uh, my brother in his uh, cannabis company uh, headquarters uh, allows us to do some amazing events there. We'll be doing another one on the Friday, the 29th. So mark your calendars. Lily, put that in there. Friday, April 29th, we're doing a meetup in downtown LA. Check out for details on that. That's going to be super cool. Um, and finally, though, for those people that are interested, we just announced this. We're doing our first mastermind, and it will be here in Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, it's going to be incredible. We have some speakers are going to come out. We have uh, some mastermind sessions. Mostly it's a, it's going to be a mastermind revolved around real estate, but there is definitely going to be some entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship spin to it because, you know, we're helping people build businesses. We're helping people build real estate investment, biz, a business and or a, get to that next level in real estate investing. Um, so I've been a part of many masterminds that I think people have been asking us for a while to do our own. And so we're finally doing it. So if you guys are interested in that, it isn't free, uh, but I guarantee you that you're going to get your money's worth uh, because it's going to be the best event that we've ever done. Yeah, and, and um, you know, like you said, Alex, I think it's a great opportunity to come together, uh, mastermind with some other um, like-minded people. Every time we go to masterminds, we've gone to several. Um, you know, I know you go to one every quarter at least, um, and I try to get out to about one or two a year um, as well, um, if not quarterly. I mean, like these these are opportunities where, you're not just learning from the, the keynote speaker or the presenter, um, but you're actually meeting with people that are also qualified to be in that room and that are qualified to kind of be there based on the fact that they also maybe run a successful business that's in the same line of business that you are and that can help you, you know, make your business leaner and, you know, more greener, right? More, more dinero, more money in your pocket. So um, almost every mastermind we go to, Alex, we come back and we're like, we're implementing this, we're implementing that, we're doing this. Uh, yeah, let's think about this. We, we do this amazing meetup downtown LA. I mean, you get like five, 10 minutes with you or I, you know, it's like uh, we try to, we're trying to, we're talking to a lot of people. When you're, you're joining masterminds, you're around other people for days, for long periods of time. You're in an environment that is, is structured for everybody to kind of grow together, help each other out. Um, and really, it's, we're not even doing it for the money, even though it's, I mean, we can't host an event this amazing for free. Like it's just not going to happen. Um, and then all, obviously you, you take more action when you invest and you pay to play. Um, I paid, you know, to be thousands and thousands of dollars to be in rooms, people 
that are at a much higher level than me. You know, think about this. I, I mean, I spent time with people that are, you know, in different on a much lower level as far as on the journey of real estate investing than me, p my peers. And then, and there's times where I'm in rooms, I'm, I'm a big fish in that room. And there's times I'm in a room, but I'm the smallest fish by far. So you guys have to be, put yourself around those different rooms. That way you can uh, grow as a real estate investor and an individual, but don't think that you're going to be able to do that always for free because that's just not the case. I'm just, no, and I, I remember the first mastermind I went to, you know, you paid for, um, you know, for me to get in there and, and uh, you know, it was worthwhile, right? Because I was the smallest fish in the room at that mastermind. And, you know, now when we go back to that same mastermind, it's, it's you know, the, the tables have turned, right? There's people that are like, you know, wow, well, what you were able to do in, in a year is, is incredible. Like, I want to do that same thing in a year. And, you know, like you said, Alex, you're not going to get that from five minutes in, in passing with someone, um, you know, at a quick meetup. You're going to get that from an immersion with somebody multiple days, like hanging out, going to dinner, being able to be like, Hey man, you know, yesterday you were talking about this. I was able to digest that. I was able to really let that sink in, think about it. And I have some follow-up, you know, questions so that I can make that work for me. And, and, uh, you know, again, you're, you're just not able to do that in, in a quick passing or a quick setting. So this should be a fun one. I'm excited for it. And, uh, should be, should be really fun to get things going. Um, Alex, if you don't mind making me host real quick, what we're going to do next guys is, uh, we'll go ahead and have Alex, uh, start sharing his screen and um, once we do that, um, so I'll make you co-host here, Alex. So you should be able to share your screen here. And then in the meantime, guys, while Alex is pulling up one of our deals that we wanted to take a look at, I'm just going to drop a quick poll for you guys. And the poll is uh, going to just ask you guys if you have any interest in attending the uh, Mexico Mastermind that we were just talking about. We're going to do this down in Guadalajara, Mexico. And it'll be going down from um, 6, 7 to 6, 11. So that's, um, you know, June 7th to 11th are the dates. So we kind of chose 7, 11, uh, nice little four day window. And then I believe we're doing a, a, a final day on Saturday, uh, which should be really, really exciting. That's going to be a, a bonus event, a bonus trip um, that we won't announce just yet. I don't believe, but we will announce very soon uh, to the folks that are coming with us. And that's actually the Saturday, the 11th event. Um, so that'll be a little bit different than a, a full mastermind. You know, we'll, we'll be doing some other stuff in addition to that. So again, let us know um, if you are interested in that way, we can get in touch with you guys and get you some more information about coming out and joining us. Then guys, uh, if you guys have any questions on this deal that we are looking at, um, this is going to be the uh, deal that we just closed. As Alex mentioned, this was up in the city of Sun Valley. So we were able to close on this deal from a wholesaler. Um, so I'll give you guys a quick skinny and then Alex will kind of run through the, the what we call like our post-mortem on the deal. Um, but the skinny on it is we bought it from a wholesaler. We were able to negotiate down from the original asking price and get a, a little bit money back from the wholesaler. Um, it's because it was an extensive rehab. Like Alex said, we, did a, we ended up doing about a 90K uh, rehab on this project. Um, but the project looked fantastic. If you guys haven't had a chance, go check out Alex's Instagram post um, from today. It just, it, it absolutely looks uh, phenomenal. And this property is, um, you know, one that we are, are proud of because again, like it's a, it's a, a full team effort. We had Amari, our project manager, um, who was working on this one. He was able to kind of, you know, crush it on his second project um, ever with us. And, and uh, you know, when you see people being able to kind of create results, it, it's always fun to do. So again, teamwork makes a dream work, right? All right. Let me um, open this up here. And guys, if you have any questions during the, um, the deal review, we're going to kind of review this deal and kind of show you guys how to use it. There's a Q&A feature down there in the bottom of your Zoom window. Feel free to use that and throw in any questions you guys might have um you know about this particular deal all right all right let's jump in so sun valley flip so let's go ahead and pull it up on a google map just to kind of give people an idea like where sun valley is um and then we can do the flip calculator and everything on there as well so yeah on this particular deal guys the uh the the property is located in the city of sun valley and that's an area in the san fernando valley uh, which is an area that Alex is, is pretty familiar right, with, right? Alex, you live in the Valley, um, you know, previously. And, and so it's an area that, um, you know, you know very well. Exactly. I used to work for Washington, which I used to be a banker actually right off of uh, 
Lower Canyon down here, over on this side of the. Uh, so it's funny, it, it sounds messed up, but we used to call this like Scum Valley. <laughs> Don't tell me why, but it, it, it just basically was a very rough part. Uh, obviously that, that was many years ago and this is since changed, but um, I know this, uh, this area very well. So whenever you know an area very well, it allows you to just have much more information, much more confidence in potentially doing a deal there. Um, so when we looked over the deal, I remember thinking that we were our ARV was specifically going to be closer to like the, the, the 760 to 780 mark. But if we got lucky, you can get into the eights. Um, but, you know, it was kind of a, from what I could see a, a somewhat of a tight deal because I didn't love that it did, only had two bedrooms, but it did have a, a nice footprint. If you can see, like it's, it's nice, uh, you know, wide lot, a um, lot of backyard, um, you know, and so as land gets scarcer and scarcer, and you know, it just kind of in core Los Angeles, people like to have nice big backyards. So I definitely thought that was a, a big selling point. Also, when we went to the property, it was a decent neighborhood. Like it didn't seem, you know, that rough. The, what, the neighbors next doors weren't, you know, that bad. So, you know, just a decent neighbor here, decent neighbor over here. There, was, there wasn't any like hoarders or anything next door. This guy right here just looks like a regular, just blue collar, you know, worker and the and, funny thing here alex is like this is actually us doing the rehab right here yeah yeah um so they must have driven by midway through and done some new pictures oh yeah captured in december of 2021 so we had just gotten things kind of uh you know yeah, kicked yeah. off and started at that point that's funny so we uh i remember looking at we were considering doing uh accessory dwelling units on properties nowadays and this is kind of an area that could be a good rental or property to hold or we could flip an adu and so you see the space here had an attached garage we considered it but because we bought it from a wholesaler and it was kind of like it wasn't the, the meatiest deal um we, we just didn't have enough room to potentially do more rehab hold it longer and that wasn't the kind of play but we did consider it as you guys know um whenever you review deals or i hope you guys know whenever you review deals hopefully you're looking at from a lens of from various types of exit strategies and the best deals tend to have various exit strategies uh, not only just one, oh, I could only wholesale this or, I, oh, I can only, um, you know, buy and hold this as a rental. But if you have more opportunities, that means you got a better deal, typically. So, um, yeah, so we looked at the deal, uh, Sun Valley, know the area well, um, comped it out. And now it's not the same component after the fact, but uh, that's usually the next thing, right? We look at the Google map, we see if there's any deal killers. If there's no deal killers, then uh, we'll go on to the next step. You know, kind of looking at the the, the Google Street View. Um, and, and Alex, then, for those uh, you know those folks on here, like what are deal killers? Like you know, prisons, um, commercial areas. Um, so, so yeah, so that depends on the, the deal, right. The big deal killers would be something such as being right next to like some railroad tracks and and you know something like that. Uh, being nice electrical to, wires overhead. Yeah, so those big yeah power lines uh, sometimes can be deal killers. Uh, because either entry level, you know, first time home buyers are usually newer families with newborns or just people. You I know, went to a house children. one time and Alex was like, wait, is that off of 98th Street? And I was like, yeah, it is. And he was like, the one with the big power lines in the middle of it. And I was like, yeah, bro, like I parked in the middle under the power lines. And he was like, oh, bro, that's not as good as, you know, a couple streets over. And I was like, ah, I, I found that out when I got there, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and then also if there's like commercial property, you know, it could be adjacent to, say, for example, a, a really rough apartment building or uh, some type of like, you know, a gas station, um, you know, also if it's on a main street uh, and it, for example, it's maybe a nicer area that we're looking at, maybe we're doing a, a mid-level flip. It's not like an entry level. It's kind of like a, a nice property. I would consider this San Fernando Valley, this area more of a mid-level, not entry level, because I mean, people are paying $700,000, although that is kind of entry level for San Fernando Valley now. It's crazy to say that. But so things like that directly across the street from a cemetery or we've had opportunities on stuff like that where it's like, hey, man, it's kind of hard to tell how much you can you need to reduce uh, the uh, ARV, the resale value in a property when it's directly across the street from a cemetery. Some people uh, you know, don't care, but I would say the majority of people do care and would not want to buy a house directly across from from something like that. So th those are a couple of examples. Um, also like, you know, main streets, like right on the corner of a main street, you know, two main streets, you know, that could be a potential deal killer, deal killer. Um, what else? Also, um, sometimes like in, in the Lancaster area, we've kind of come across areas where it's like kind of, it's in Lancaster, but it's like 
way outside and it's like on a dirt road you know something like that might not be something we want to do unless we're going to get a deeper discount because there's not as many comps there's again not as many people that are wanting to buy a property that far out so uh just keep in so mind good, you don't good want to, things to keep in mind right those are called deal killers right yeah and we we use those just so we don't waste time looking at a deal and then it's and then next thing you know there's a deal killer and you're like, well, I just spent an extra, you know, 12 minutes looking at a deal that had a deal killer. So try, we try and that's to why we, up. you know, we use that Google maps too. Cause you can see like, oh man, my house actually looks right across to a cemetery. Like that, that's, that's going to be a deal killer. You know, every day you drive out of your backyard you know, or out of your garage and you're looking into a cemetery. Like that's, that's not as, not as good as the house on the interior street a block or two away. Those are, those are different comps. Yeah. So good exactly. stuff, man. Let's take a look at this deal and dive in. Um, guys, if you don't have MLS, you can also do the same thing on uh, Redfin or Zillow. You're basically just, you know, putting in an area and, and looking for subject properties that have closed or that are active, um, you know, within kind of a close proximity to that property. So that's what we're yeah. looking at right here. So, so uh, I'll, I'll show you guys real quickly. What we typically like to do is look at the tax records. Um, there's services such as, um, I forget the name right now off the top of my head, but property radar, also prop stream. So there's services you can pay for monthly that gives you access to this data. So, um, oh wow, they already updated the records. That's great. Um, so these tax records, I like to look at these tax records because I wanna know exactly on the square footage, the square footage that's on record, tax records. So it's show, showing a thousand square feet. Um, and then what the year built and just the real details of the property, the zoning is here as well. So there's relevant information, the lot size, everything is, uh, you know, something of detail that you need to kind of look into on that property. So uh, we go to tax records, then I, I want to pull comps after that, because I really want to know what, because it might, they might tell you it's a, a 1500 square foot house, but then what if like three, 400 square feet of that property is illegal or unpermitted? Then well, guys, that's why Alex does that first. Because again, like you're saying, Alex, like you can shave five or 10 minutes of your of time off of your research if you know hey, this wholesaler is advertising this as 1,500, tax records show 1,000. So you want to, like, I wanted to just kind of point that out. Um, sorry to interrupt you there, Alex, but I mean, like, that, that's a really big key, the order of operations, right? Start with Google Maps, then start with your tax records so that you can get an actual idea of what the, 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 the city there thinks you have, and then go work with what you're looking at. Great, yes, great points there, man. Yes, exactly. And then uh, I'll continue to add on that a little bit on the tax records. Um, there's also like special assessments and uh, things like that. So this will tell you sometimes if there's uh, like, for example, these people sometimes get those solar leases and those solar leases, oh, you get those people knocking on your door and they're like, oh, well, you can do it, not, nothing out of pocket. But what they don't tell you is that they're going to put like a, a lien against the property. It's going to increase these special assessments. Um, also, they could be doing like a massive uh, kind of improvement of the streets nearby and this could be a, a much higher than this so just certain things like that to, to watch out for um also when i'm talking to a direct to seller you know i like to have an idea of like how much is the mortgage payment right like or mortgage amount on the property and looking at tax records can help you with that sometimes as well we're like okay well this person i'm talking to they look like they have their there's no loan on the property so it's free and clear okay cool well this person has a property that's free and clear i didn't necessarily have to ask them because I was able to look on tax records. So there's just a lot of data there that can you know, arm you to like be more prepared for the opportunity or ask more specific questions or not ask questions that you already have kind of answers to. And you're more like, you can just more like confirming information from the other party that you're talking to. Um, and now after this, I, before I forget, like in the, also in the County of Los Angeles, um, there's also um, part of the due diligence you guys is looking to see if there's because let's face it, a lot of times when we're dealing with these investment properties, they're a mess. There's code violations. There's issues with the city. There's uh, things that are just not resolved. Um, and so you have to kind of know what you're getting yourself into because that's happened to me in the past where I didn't check that. And then later on, something else came up that, again, I could have looked at on the front end. And I'm not asking you guys to do this at the very beginning of a deal, but it's just something that could happen after you got a little bit more advanced in the, in the negotiation or you've made an offer or you're about to make a more of a formal offer. Um, or if you notice a discrepancy, right? Like if you notice a discrepancy between tax records and MLS records, like what is that extra 400 square feet? You might be able to find some information here, right? Yeah, so um, looking for example, so there's this is uh, Los Angeles. This is a city of LA. Not every city has access to this, but 
Um, I also want you guys to start to getting used to and being okay with and comfortable with walking to your city, walking into your whatever area that is, or calling and asking for information on a property you're interested in buying because you know these are counties, these are cities, these are municipalities that you know overall we were you know we're tax paying citizens, right? So we had these these uh, these people in some way. I wouldn't say work for you, but they're working for that city. And so they're, they're, they're there to help out and give information to potential property owners in that area. So uh, I've gone into the city of Compton, city of Southgate, city, you know, a city of LA, county of LA, county of uh, San Bernardino, all these different areas and ask questions about property that I was either purchasing, had purchased um, or, or things of that nature. So that's another part of, uh, you know, being an investor, your due diligence, checking up on things that um, will give you information, help you make decisions on, on properties and, you know, where things are at and all that good stuff. So any, any questions about that, let me know guys, but um, and that's very important as well to be able to. And guys, again, use that Q and a feature down there. If you do have any questions on this, cause this is some, some good stuff. And again, Alex, these are public records, right? Like you don't have an account to get into here. You can yeah, just, I just typed in LADB. LADBS and you can find this. So anybody can use this page, right? Yeah. And so like, for example, in 2006, this property was uh, flagged for having a garage, garage that was converted into a dwelling. So if this status said open or like unresolved or pending, it's a code violation. And you're thinking about buying a property you know, don't you think that's relevant? Something you should know. And that's perhaps something you would want to ask the seller, perhaps something you want to watch the agent. Uh, sometimes you, something you would want to ask the wholesaler. And so you sometimes can, they have the signed paperwork and they'll hand it over to you and be like, yeah, here the inspector came out. It just, I guess it didn't get, you know, put on city. And then at least, you know, like, Hey, I, I, I got a resolution for that. Cause I like that Alex, right? Like sometimes you're going to find stuff on here that causes you to pivot and, or gives you some better questions when you do ask. And like you said, like this is usually a good thing to do once you're into that due diligence, you know, period of, of a deal, right? Yeah, because uh, remember, guys, buying property is not like it's just a wham, bam, thank you, man. Like you make offers on properties that fit your purchase criteria. After you make offers, you get, you know, counter offers, you get into negotiations. Once you get into negotiations, you know, that's perhaps this is where maybe this comes into place a little bit more. Um, also, it helps, like, for example, the permit information I'm looking at right here. I remember specifically a property that we flipped in uh, uh, La Mirada where we went and we requested it from the city of La Mirada. They send us the records and we seen that they had put, the owner had pulled permits to replace the roof and add solar, you know, at, at like two or three years previous. And so we had the name of the company that did the, you know, the, the solar and you know the roof itself, right? The contractor, we had the dates that they did everything. And we knew essentially we're not going to have to redo this roof. Uh, you know what I mean? And so those are valuable pieces of information that you can do. Now, another thing, if you do have access to MLS, you could actually type in here, um, like just the address of the property. If there was previous listings of the property, um, you could look and see what the pictures look like. Perhaps you're not able to get pictures from the seller. So this is a canceled listing, uh, but like sometimes this has happened where it would be a, like a, a listing from three years ago when they bought it or four years ago when they attempted to list it. And then you're just reading information about that property they're potentially going to buy. And again, any way you can get data points from the a property you're in the opportunity you're looking into, these are kind of a couple of examples of the investigative work it takes to really know what you have on your hands. So that way you can you know, move forward confidently with a deal or an offer. Cool. Um, Good stuff, man. I mean, again, these are all just like little, little tips, little tricks, little nuances that you know, help you get, get into better, com you know, communication when you are calling these agents or like you said, even, you know, speaking directly to a seller. Those are questions that, you know, you're probably going to want resolved before you make a purchase. Yeah. So we, when we pulled uh, MLS data right here, um, we'll see, uh, we're looking for the active, active under contract pending and closed in a single family within a half mile. If we don't see enough activity, we can always stretch this out and it's a half mile from the property address. Initially, I don't put any filter for the living area or any of the lot size or any of that yet because I just want to get a snapshot of what's kind of happening. And uh, I've said this before on previous deal reviews, but this is such, such an important screen um, because you're able to see, in, it's called a one line view, agent one line. You're able to kind of see in a snapshot, you know, the type of property or the, the status. Okay, these are all, this is, there's only one active listing. We all know this, but it's different when you're able to see and be like, hey man, I pulled up all the properties that have sold or been active and all that in the last six months. And we, we pulled up 21 and there's only one house for sale that's active. Everything else, this is under contract, is pending, 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 and these are all sold. So traditionally, uh, the more active properties there are, 
the more it'd be closer to like a, a buyer's market. So we're still in the seller's market. Sure, interest rates are going down, are going up, I'm sorry. Uh, inventory is increasing, but like it's instead of being like no houses for sale or one or two houses for sale, now there's like three or four, you know what I mean? So there's still a lot of buyers out there that are still needed to buy houses. So uh, you hear the news and it just really clickbait because it's not really that accurate. Um, uh, anyways, so you look at here, another thing that draws my eye attention um, let me see if I could in, kind of increase the size a little bit here in case you guys can't see or looking on your phone. Much but, better, man. Zoom in maybe one or two more if you can. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And so what, what I look for here, if, if I'm looking from here down, from number seven down, I'm trying to kind of get an idea of what are most houses selling for in this neighborhood, right? So we have a kind of a 600,000, 655, 675, 675, all that, some sevens now, some eights, and even a nine right here. So what I typically do is like the lowest and the highest, I kind of just like take out, right? Because those are the extremes. And then we kind of work in the middle. And then now we're also looking here, let me get rid of our heads here. But then you start looking at stuff like per square foot a little bit, just get an idea of where things are at. You don't see a thousand dollars per square foot, but you also don't see anything with the two in front of it. Also nothing with the three in front of it. So, and this is just one neighborhood within a half mile, one part of Southern California, right? So that's why it's so important that you look at a lot of deals. So you get a read on everything. You got the different varieties of uh, bedroom bathroom accounts. And then you also have the square footages of the property and the year built and the lot size here. But yep. they're not as important, generally speaking, than um, what I was just showing you earlier, just because I'm trying to read real quick. Now I can do a couple of filters. I know based on me looking on official tax records, this property is a thousand square feet, uh, a little bit north of a thousand square feet, I think 1,042. General rule, rule of thumb when you're analyzing property is that your properties that should you're comparing them to should be within about 10 to max 15% gross square footage. So I like to just do quick numbers. So say for example, a thousand, I'll just say round it down to a thousand. So I, I don't really wanna be more than maybe 50, 150 square feet, maybe 200 square feet max difference. So um, I might just do then a quick, just a quick numbers. Uh, let's just do 800 square feet to 1250. Just kind of, again, this is like, there's an art and a science to it. So I don't want you guys to think like, oh, only do like exactly 10% because that's what an appraiser has to do. Well, you might miss a comp that's like 11% larger than your property. That's like a direct comp that is a model match. And it would be dumb for that appraisal not to, not to use that. Or it would be dumb for you not to actually take that into consideration. And especially if it's like a flip and it's very similar to the type of product you might actually be putting onto the market. Does that make sense? Yeah, love those, uh, love those little gems, man. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, and then so now you have a little bit. I, I like to narrow it down between like this is perfect actually, like eight to the around six to eight properties, ten maybe no more than really ten. Uh, I think to make a determination of where you're kind of at as far as ARV and exit wise, and you see like where it's six forty to like a higher of seven hundred, and then now we've uh, we have our comp here, which kind of set uh, set a record. Now we weren't shooting to set a record. We were just looking to like our original numbers. If we want to go back, was, we bought it for 570. We anticipated a, a comfortable exit of somewhere about seven. I think it was 770, 770 or 760 or something like that. Yeah, 765. We originally planned on spending about 75,000 on the rehab. Um, and then, yes, let me see here, 50% down. I think we were at one point on our lenders or one and a half points and seven and a quarter interest or seven or something like that. Yeah, and we had to do 2%, no, no, I'm sorry, one and a half percent for the agent. This was the core loss hand. Just so yeah, this was our, so, very similar to this here. I, I don't have it directly from me, sorry guys. But so you see, uh, we, we usually want to be at a minimum of profit of 50 to 60,000 on deals that are a certain price tag uh, over like 400, 450,000 pr um, purchase price um, or 30%. It has to hit one of those numbers. So it didn't quite hit the 30% we were looking for, but it hit the minimum profit. And we also knew since there was room for upside that this number could turn into a number close to $100,000. Um, and it was a project, even though it was a heavy rehab, it was pretty beat up. It wasn't like, and I know it didn't show up on the comps that you had because it was actually like about 300 days ago, but there was a, a home that we were using for that upside at 800K yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the area. So that was kind of our, our, let me our go big, back. 
exactly so it's hard to recreate the exact thing that we were looking at because this is like a six month old deal but let's just type in 365 so we can go all the way back and we'll look at that one here it is this is i think this was That's our exit client. it was 0.1 one mile away it sold for a 10 is 1200 this was our exit comments where it sold in one day it sold for asking um and look at the pictures tell me if you can see them Yes, sir. We see them. So they did new windows, new door, new patio. We did new windows, new door, new patio, new floors. We did this. We did new kitchen. We did a similar bath. Like we, we did this. Yeah. So, and that's the point guys that this was our exit comp. Uh, and you see, they didn't do much in the backyard. And we actually did a backyard. If you guys came to the meetup, we had, you know, s'mores back there. We had uh, some hot chocolate back there. We were hanging out under a gazebo. Uh, and so we did a little bit more to our backyard. So this was our, you know, we were we were looking and we were like, hey man, we could do 770 as a, as a low, very conservative. Oh yeah, and see, this one, this one also, this one sold and it was right close to us and sold for 770, and then it look at the condition of it. it it's clean, but like the pictures are not that great. It's not as nice as what we put out, right? Yeah, and so we're like, look at this. We we're gonna be superior to this, uh, although I think this one is a little bit bigger, a three bedroom, and we're not a three bedroom. But when you take in consideration, you do all these like kind of plus minuses on your analysis. We're like, dude, this name, this is literally like two doors down from us, and it sold for seven seventy in five days uh, in a far inferior uh, condition than what we were going to be when we come to market. And it yep. did have an initial bedroom and all that. So our exit, this was for me more of our, a comfortable exit than the eight ten. I didn't want to like shoot for eight ten. And then we negotiated because the, the wholesaler wanted five ninety for it. So we negotiated the wholesaler down like. I think 20 grand or something like that credit to will because he you know they call him low ball wall for a reason gentlemen ladies and gentlemen because he's a, he's a low baller and, and uh you know you can go look at the um the calculator again if we if we're, and guys like what we'll do is is like alex said like has to hit one of two of those two meters but if you put an 810 on there and I think that's what we did. And then if we put in 80K as our rehab, and we were like, what if we put an extra little bit of extra little touch into there or something? You know, we were like, hey, this could be an, a close to a six-figure deal, right? This could be, you know, pretty, pretty nice spread on there. And that's those are the kind of deals that we shoot for, deals that have high upside and they have to hit on the base case one of those two scenarios, the ROI yeah. or the profit, right? Like we have to know that on our regular base scenario. Like if we put out a clean brand new property compared to that three, two, that was a, an older lived in property, like we're going to be able to do it. And, you know, this is Alex showing you the worst case here. Yeah. And then worst case, we're like, damn, I think even worse case, we're going to get 750 for the property and the wor uh, worst case on the rehab can go over like close to a hundred grand. I mean, it is a thousand square foot house. So it's like, we're not rebuilding this thing. We're like, how can we spend? We ended up ended up spending <laughs> about this anyway, but since yep. we got the 840, you know, essentially it was a six figure deal. So as you see, that's uh, I, I don't want to go into the too much detail with the best and wait, worst case, because I'm sure some of you have seen the, our kind of calculator. If you guys, if any of you on this call have not uh, got a copy of our calculator and a tutorial, let us know, we'll send you the free version. That's what we, uh, you know, we, just so people can analyze and get better analyzing deals. But that's essentially what how the deal kind of turned out, give or take. Uh, I think it was a little bit less than that, but it was six figures. So as you see, it had very, it was a manageable downside. If everything went wrong, we were likely to like just make you know, 20, I mean, I think it was here. Yeah. Uh, like 30, 30 something grand, 15%, but then with a huge upside potential. And then, um, so that's the type of deals that we, uh, we pursue and we typically will go for low downside potential, low downside risk with, uh, a it very nice suck to make 15, 20 grand on this deal. Like you said, a heavy rehab, but like that was our worst case scenario. Yeah. You know, that and that base case is like, Hey man, we're going to probably make a base hit deal 50 K. Like it's not, you know, go right home to grandma or anything about, but it's, it's, Hey, that was a good deal. Um, and then it had that higher upside where we thought we might make 80, 85 K and it ended up being about a hundred, 105 K, 107 K. So, um, just, to, just again, like to show you guys why you look for deals that have the minimal risk, you know, moderate, you know, you know, conservative, but moderate, uh, base case scenarios. And then that, that, uh, that high end, uh, close scenario. Yeah. And I do want to say a couple of things about it. The reason we do the postmortem is because I think it's easy to just pat yourself on the back and say, Oh, wow, we did amazing. We made, you know, we made a ton of money, uh, blah, 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 but that's not how we feel. Yes. We're happy. And we, you know, we are celebrating that, that we got the deal done, but it also took an extra month, uh, than we expected. And it slowed things down because I personally had 
close to hundred grand of my money in there. Plus, speaking of that, Alex, can you pull up the calculator again, real quick, and just show us the the months on there? Because uh, Jonathan is asking a great question right now. And, and guys, again, if you have any questions, use that Q and A feature down here at the bottom. But his question is, what is our average holding time on flips? And so that's actually that number that you guys are going to see. The days held to one thirty five. And so when Alex changes this number around. Watch the ROI and the profit number up there at the top kind of change around, right? Because that is how many days held. And our average days held, Alex, um, is about three to four months on most of our flips. Yeah, well, we actually measure it more by days because um, that's kind of the way we look at things. So our average days hold time is 135 to 150 days. 150 days is five months. And then uh, so four and a half to five months is, is generally uh, we're in and out of our deals during that time frame, this one ended up taking about 183 days, so uh, six, a little bit more than six months. Um, Alex, quick, yeah. uh, quick um, on the L and M over there in the L and M columns over on your far right. Um, so, guys, that's that's to Jonathan's question where we kind of edit those numbers. So, so what we do is we just kind of kind of figure out um, one 20 day rehab, Alex. That's four months, right? At 30 days in a month. Yeah. That would be a four month rehab and a listing period of 14 days. Why did we think that, Alex? Because the house is on the market. The one couple homes down went in five days. The home, our number, one, our main comp went in one day. So we said, hey, you know, those are going in less than a week. You know, we can assume that a 14 day listing period, that sounds pretty fair. Would you agree, Alex? Yeah, exactly. And so we, we go off of that. Like, how long is this going to take? Because there's different phases, right? How long you start paying interest on the house? And the day you close on it, they all won. that before work, you know, you know, making offers on that, you're not into the deal and you real money. But once you actually close on it, your money is out there and it needs to be, you know, getting a return on its investment. So that's where like, or typically we want this rehab period to be 30, 60, I mean, 90 days max. This one ended up turning out to be, um, I don't remember, I don't have the exact date in front of me, sorry guys, but this is what we, we look at. The rehab period, the listing period, a listing period now is typically about two weeks. In some areas, it could be longer. Like when we were in La Quinta, it wasn't an area, it's a second home kind of market. So it's not an area that we can expect bears, to be. Big bears, you know, those kind of like you're saying, Alex, the second home markets where it's it's not a primary home market might be longer. Yeah. And then, and then and the, uh, so we have a 14-day listing period. And then escrow period, typically, yes, you want a 30-day escrow. Uh, but that, when our experience, has not been like realistic because you, you open escrow, they start, you know, they do their appraisal, you know, the, the end buyer, do their inspections all that it's very and you know there's, it's so busy right now in real estate and mortgages that people are not just doing mortgages flying through them in 20 days just this is not. the one that's least in our control right because this has other moving parts and it also includes the buyer right the buyer has to get their documents in on time and and on those deadlines so um i think exactly that's why we kind of use that 45 day measure right yeah just to kind of almost pad a little bit and then we actually put a pad a two-week pad in there so if you add these four numbers up that's 192 days. That's six and a half months, right? Um, whereas if this was just like a 30-day you know, day rehab, well, now you're talking about flipping the house potentially from A to Z from, well, not A to Z because A would really be from origination, but let's just say from A to Z, meaning from when you close on the property to when you actually have your money back and, you know, and all your profit back, that's 103 days. Some of our best deals we've been able to flip in about 70 to 80 days. That's not normal, uh, but you know, we, we banked through the rehab. Uh, we had a quick escrow. We didn't fall out of escrow because it does happen on this one here. We had this buyer had to go switch their uh, loan to someone else. And we were waiting on the money to close on a couple other deals. And we ended up having to like leverage some of our network to like, you know, close on these other deals. So it wasn't ideal. Um, I can, and Alex, we, uh, you know, pad, pad just means like, uh, you know, fudge time, right? Like extra time, like pad guys, that could mean that your rehab went a week over. That could mean that your listing period went a week over, right? That could mean that, hey, man, instead of it taking two weeks open house, it actually took three. So like Alex said, we're just kind of like padding those days in there. It doesn't necessarily mean that those are going to happen. Um, but Alex, can, I, can you dive into something real quick about the FHA 90-day rule and how that might affect people over there on that, that column? Yeah, so on this column here, if you haven't owned the property for at least 90 days, uh, the end buyer that's buying the property if you're flipping it cannot um, be a fha buyer because it limits the uh financing available to the end buyers so that's been a problem that we've had on some of the more cosmetic entry-level deals because we do the rehab quickly we're back onto the market in 30 days 
we actually have to either uh, just get a conventional buyer uh, that's someone that's getting a conventional loan and not FHA. Uh, so we are- and That goes reduced. from three and a half to 20% or 10% down in some cases, right? Which is a significant jump for the buyer. Yeah, we're, so we're, you're reducing the, the buyer pool. And in flipping, um, you do want the largest buyer pools possible. Uh, in you know, buy and hold property, you want the largest renter pool as possible, right? Yep. And, uh, or just the, the, the renter pool that you're looking for, the demographics you're looking for, better said, for, for renting and long-term stuff. Um, also Airbnb, you know, right? You, you want people to, you know, they're, they're actually the demand for the sh that short-term rental type of uh, property and product that if you're going to be doing an Airbnb. So always thinking about your end buyers or the amount of your end buyers is very important. And so, yeah, like we're not able to offer it, uh, this property to anybody that's going to be getting an FHA loan. Now our agents disclose that on the listing agreement or the listing. Uh, so then that way people know, hey, a subject to a 90 day flip rule, we can't accept anything until this date. Um, there has been times in certain properties where we kind of had to wait it out a little bit and where we're like, hey, this thing's going to take 60 days of rehab, but you know, we don't mind waiting that extra 30 days to potentially have more. Um, now that's not ideal, but it does happen. So you have to adjust um, and just your understand. Whole days. Your, your, and again, that means again, guys, even if you are, you can, you can replace rehab and you could add hold. So like Alex said, you could put 60 days of hold above that rehab on the M and L columns, you know, so instead of just having 30 up there, you could, you could add a hold column if you needed to and, and put, you know, hold is 60 days, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, but just know again, guys, like keep that in mind because like Alex said, having that biggest buyer pool at the end of things really is important um, when you're working on, on getting these things in. And uh, we talk about it as well, Alex, the buyer avatar, right? Like who is this end person that we are, you know, selling this house to and, um, you know, that that's important for you to know as well. Like yeah, that makes me that think of the a property we had in California City where we were having a delay with the windows, but because the delay in the windows gave us a little bit more time and allowed us to have the property finished. I didn't want to list the property without the windows being done because I think I thought it looked crappy, number one. And then number two, I'm like, well, if we wait the extra three weeks or two and a half weeks to get the windows and then install those, then now we're going to be closer to that 90 day rule. And then we're going to have you know, a ton of new buy more buyers available for this property. And so, you know, you have to kind of weigh those things out as an investor. And then when um, also like the holding cost. So if it's going to cost me, you know, $1,200 to hold this property for an extra 30 days, but then I have, you know, dozens of more buyers, uh, I willing to bet that that's going to be uh, better for us in the long term because we're going to be able to maybe get 5,000, 10,000 more for the property. And then we're just going to spend maybe a thousand dollars more on another mortgage payment because of holding it longer. Well, Alex, I mean, again, I, I thought this was incredible stuff, kind of breaking down a, uh, you know, an actual deal, guys. This was a six-figure flip, um, you know, that we were able to do um, here in core Los Angeles, right up in the valley, um, purchased from a wholesaler, you know, so some somebody else, you know, made money on this deal. And, and uh, you know, I think when we look at this, Alex, like when we do these flips, like a lot of people eat, right? The wholesaler ate on this, our contractors ate on this our title reps, our, you know, escrows, our project managers, our private lenders. Don't forget about the most important person. Yeah, we ate, you know, we you, ate, right? You, buddy. Yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know we, we ate on this deal too. And, and like, these are the kind of deals that, you know, you guys can find in your backyard, um, you know, from other investors, from other wholesalers, because that's what, you know, ultimately wholesalers are, is they're other investors. So um, just wanted to open the, the room real quick. We'll, uh, we'll do what we normally do here and let everybody um, kind of get on share screen with us. And if you guys have any questions on anything that we went over today, um, right now is the time to get in there and kind of ask because, um, you know, we got about five, 10 minutes left on here, right? Yeah, I want to say something to all about the team meeting. And I think if you're working on profitable deals, um, you know, we have a hybrid business where mostly everybody's tied to the profit of the deals rather than, you know, a bunch of people being on payroll and us having a very high payroll. So, you know, Will, you know, you know, is making a you know, good amount of money on the deal. The project manager is making money on the deal. All the contractors that worked on it are making money. Um, the, uh, the virtual assistants that helped with the transaction coordination made some bonuses on that. Um, and, and pretty much, you know, and obviously I get a good return on the capital that I put into the deal. And then our hard money lender makes money on the deal. And also our insurance lady makes money on the deal. I mean, I could go down the, down the, down the whole list, but there's a lot of people eating per deal. And so you're doing multiple deals. You're helping a lot of people, uh, you know, grow, make money, and everybody's winning together. Um, so, you know, I think that that's a, that what we love about this business that we're able to uh, make sure that you know this. It's not just about making money, but everybody's eating and everybody's growing. But everybody also has a role that that they have to perform on to get this thing done to the finish line. 
Um, also, the listing agents, are they pretty well in this deal too? Listing and buying agents. Yeah. So, guys, anybody have any questions? Um, you know, feel free to kind of chime in if you guys, um, you know, wanted to, to get any more info. Again, we're doing this Mexico Mastermind uh, here in a couple of months. We're going to be doing a meetup in a couple of weeks where Alex is going to be back in LA. So, we'll be in downtown LA. Um, I did post a link in the Facebook. Um, so, it's over there in the chat. So, if you guys want to, get a look at that calculator that we're using to analyze that deal today. Um, that's our flip deal calculator. We use that regularly. And that's, you know, the link where you guys can get a copy of that is right there on that Facebook group. And uh, that's usually where we announce those meetups and those events uh, in there as well. So we'll have a flyer and a link. Cool stuff. Anybody, any questions? If not, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Um, you know, we're promoting folks in, in here into the panelists. So if you guys do want to join in and, uh, and share the screen with us, let us know. And if not, um, you know, again, this was a fun week, just kind of diving in, doing some deal review. Uh, I think we have a special guest coming up in a couple weeks. That'll be fun. And, and uh, we'll announce that on the Facebook group as well. So keep an eye out uh, for when we do announce that. Good stuff, guys. Anything else? If not, man, let's catch you on the flip side. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining. See you next week. Let's go. Let's go.